We had a great discussion yesterday on sports streaming and esports, and we touched on some of the topics that we're going to touch on today, but we're going to dive even deeper into live streaming in specific, uh, especially live streaming in the new normal. Uh, how has COVID changed live streaming, and how far-reaching are those changes likely to be in the long term? We cover those topics frequently on our streaming media producer site, and one of our regular contributors is Sean Lamb. And Sean is going to be moderating our all-star panel today. And so I'll pass things over to Sean. Sean. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, a big thank you to my panelists. We have Jonathan Healy. He's the Vice President of Marketing and Digital Strategy from Dayglow Presents. Uh, you're going to have to say hi, uh, Jonathan, there so that the camera goes on you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll pass it off to Corey Benke. He's the producer and co-founder of LiveX. Hello. Thanks for having me. Where are you joining us from, Corey? I'm uh, right out here outside of Lambeau Field, so uh, a, a live X Green Bay. All right, and Ali Hojat, the Director of Product Marketing from Intertrust Technologies. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And we have Jeff Kethley, Executive uh, Director and President of Live Sports TV. Good morning, everybody, and welcome from sunny and cool for once, Southeast Texas. All right. Um, I'm joining you guys from Port Coquitlam, which is a suburb of Vancouver in Canada. And, you know, it's, it's interesting for me in this new COVID era that to be on this side of the camera for once, right? I, I think like you guys, we're, we're used to producing content for our clients and to be on this side of the lens is kind of a unique experience. So we're experiencing the same things that they're going through um, when they're you know, behind the webcam, and that is webcam technology, right? The, the auto exposure, the auto white balance changes. Um, you know, thankfully, we're he mostly wearing headsets here, and, and we're closing that, that audio feedback loop, but that's definitely a challenge that uh, we've all experienced. We've seen it in productions, and we've probably had them creep into some of our own, and especially during the rehearsals before we uh, nip that one in the bud and uh, got them to put headsets on and close those loops. Um, what I wanted to get from you guys was, you know, what is it like now, this new normal? I mean, our description, you know, of this panel here is talking about a lot of the changes and talks a little bit of the at-home production that uh, definitely is entering in there. But you guys also represent some uh, really large productions or you, you, you take part in that, you know, from sports and uh, um, DRM technologies there and, you know, live concerts. So, Let's start off with Ali there. Um, what is, what, what's our audience like today? Um, can you tell us about the audience and revenue of live streaming? Because it's not just about viewing, there's actually a monetization component of live streaming. Absolutely. Uh, that's a very good question to start with, I think. So generally the landscape of, you know, streaming services today includes SWAT services, uh, virtual MVPDs like Hulu, Sling TV, and direct to consumer services. And so uh, what I have read recently, the forecast of the revenue from subscription is gonna be around $24 billion by 2024. Uh, but that's not it. And technically the big driver of uh, streaming is on advertising expenditure and the estimate of 56 billion ad revenue by uh, 2024 kind of sums this up to be about $80 billion revenue from just the streaming. Now, if you look at the breakdown of traffic between live streaming and non-live, you actually see that the live portion is growing and it used to be before, but the estimate is like by 2024, live streaming will actually surpass non-live and it would be at least 50% of the traffic. So if you use the rationale of revenue associated to the traffic, you're gonna see that we kind of are gonna hit $40 billion revenue just from live streaming from subscriptions and ad by 2024. And that's a massive number to uh, actually consider for our industry. Those are huge numbers. I mean, we're talking, you know, 40 billion. I mean, that, that's a big, big number. Um, tell us a bit about your company, Intertrust there and, and how they're positioned uh, to, to be a, a big player in that market there and to help protect uh, a lot of the streams that are going out there. Cause there's obviously concerns when you're, you're streaming and there's that much money being thrown around. Uh, exactly. So uh, Intertrust is actually a global technology company that offers several 
complete security solutions and rights management solutions. Uh, in the sense of media entertainment specifically, they've been offering a multi-DRM uh, platform, a cloud-based multi-DRM platform for many years that is protecting both live and non-live streaming platforms. At the same time, we offer a suite of anti-piracy services, which is very important for live streaming piracy. So look at the live streaming. Obviously, the revenues are growing significantly. Pirates are taking advantage of this uh, growth. And uh, the main point is that you are on top of this piracy during live events. You need to be able to identify the pirated streams. You need to identify uh, where the, who is behind those pirated streams and be able to shut them down in real time. That's really the key when it comes to live streaming, whether it's a sports or an event, right? So it doesn't matter. Uh, the Intertrust offers several solutions for kind of content protection on broadcast TV, on streaming, transportation, and hospitality. But this completely media security suite is offered under Express Play brand name, which again is focusing on different use cases. And adding to that, we can offer application shielding or software protection techniques to help streaming service providers to actually protect their devices as well. So a complete suite of technologies related to streaming and uh, broadcast uh, media solutions. All right, thank you, Ali. Uh, Jeff, you work in the live sports environment. Um, how big of an issue is DRM protection uh, in the productions that you uh, produce? And, and what has the market been like for you since, I mean, you know, we've had sporting leagues shut down, things are reopening now. There's no live audience, and now everyone is having to view online. Uh, well, we were primarily, our broadcasts actually were destined to streaming for the most part, uh, though we did do some towards the, the traditional TV channels such as ESPN, uh, but Tennis Channel is our, probably our main feed. Our, our biggest client is definitely professional tennis, and so when we're doing a lot of tennis, it goes overseas into probably something handled by Ali or technology similar to that, where it's going into gaming houses and it has to be, uh, basically it has to be controlled. Otherwise, whenever you put it out on the web, it's anybody's at that point, and they want to be able to control where that content's going uh, because they have certain advantages whenever they're getting a faster stream than what a typical public stream would be. And so we don't want to have different betting houses having different advantages. And so they have a lot of instances in that application that they have to be able to control where the stream is headed. And, and it still doesn't mean we still have the Russian uh, sites picking us up within about five, six minutes, something like that. But that's just something that they keep continuously working at, working at, working at, and just nothing against Russians, but that's just where they always end up at. And, uh, and then we end up with just content everywhere at that point. And, and they don't try to hide it. I, it that's the, the part that just drives me insane is like, that's our graphics, our branding, our announcer. They're not just taking the feed and then trying to create something new. They're just literally just cutting it, screen scraping it, and then putting it out on the web on their own platform. And so it's a continual fight. As far as what we've done since March, whenever COVID hit, not a lot. March 18th, it stopped. The world stopped turning for live sports, 100%. And there's a lot of big stuff happening out there. And Corey's right across from a place that's actually about to start happening even bigger again. But uh, for us in the, uh, in the general regional and uh, the more specialty sports market, uh, especially with tennis, it, tennis is happening, but it's only at the very upper tier. So uh, there's a limited amount of events going on at this point. I, I definitely can speak to the, the live tennis component there. I actually took out a membership for, to watch some WTA matches. That's the women's tennis match. Uh, Canada's Eugenie Bouchard, um, she made it to the finals there in, uh, I want to say it was Istanbul, and now she's entering the third round there in the French Open. So I'm, I'm watching her avidly there. And, um, the, you know, you're probably not involved in that level there of the WTA in the French Open. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, we, we actually yeah. have some WTA events that we were doing and uh, they were canceled, you know, so there was WTA and ATP both. We do them bo both. And uh, matter of fact, uh, there was one that was canceled that was right up there next to you in Vancouver up at Hollyburn uh, Country Club. And, and it was, that was one of the best tournaments of the year. Love that area. It's nice and cool and everything. So we always got everybody fought about going up there since it was so nice. And so such a great tournament to start with. But those guys, I mean, they just basically had no choices. It, the ATP was not supporting 
this uh, challenger circuit and the lower uh, tour events like the 250s. So uh, everybody was holding their breath for US Open. As soon as the US Open happened, there was no major, no major problems, sort of Djokovic trying to kill that poor lady with the ball. But other than that, there was no major problems, uh, but it, there was no COVID issues. And so now we're just still in kind of a, a holding pattern f to find out what they want to do moving forward. Uh, unfortunately, most of our fall is in uh, university properties. So with that being the case, it's not looking real positive right now because universities are all afraid to go back to full strength. For sure, yes. Uh, yeah, well, I definitely in my own business, we noticed a, uh, you know, the world ended right in mid-March there. And, uh, you know, we rely on about 90% repeat work every year and that repeat work went down to zero and slowly building back up and, and we're i'd say we're running about 75 percent of capacity now uh which i'm really happy with but wow that was a that was a big hit and that was a, a big uh pivot we had to do in our own business uh to produce content completely virtually um, and, and to utilize a lot of different technologies, right? That we, it wasn't just us shooting with cameras. Uh, it was utilizing a lot of consumer type of uh, hardware and incorporating that. Um, Corey, can you speak a little bit to those type of workflows? I mean, you're with LiveX. You guys uh, definitely have a bit of a different approach to uh, the way you guys produce. Uh, talk to us about that. So, yeah, um, we actually, about three years ago, uh, in Las Vegas, I went to uh, NAB about three years ago. I saw this SRT alliance uh, that the NFL Network did. And I literally looked at, uh, I saw this panel and I literally looked at my main producer and I said, that's the future of our business. Over the last three years, that was about 10% of our business. So when you said what happened in March, we lost about $200,000 in business in March. And then immediately like two weeks later gained it all back plus then some because basically our 10% turned into 100%. And um, we kind of haven't stopped. Um, we're pretty much going really strong with remote. Um, the biggest things back to the sports thing that is interesting that I think we will come back to is what we found with uh, US Open of Golf is that we were doing their main show this year we didn't do it because of covid restrictions but all of the amateur comp uh, championships and all of the smaller championships we actually were have been doing remotely for the last three years because it saved them a lot of money so i think you know this acceleration is going to move to that because everybody's going to be used to it so i think there's a ton of opportunities for live streaming companies right now uh in the remote space even more like it it actually i was right uh, I didn't realize that it was going to be this fast, but um, but it's really fascinating where the space has come from the from the consumer side, but also on the professional side, and like how the audience is is okay with you know you you realize as a professional what the audience is okay with Zoom. Um, you know we're building a Zoom farm. We just built a Zoom farm last month. I was like when it first came out, I was like no, we're not going to use Zoom. We're going to use all this other technology. And then you know you find that the consumer is using this product, and the consumer is your remote. So you need to use this product and and understand what the consumer needs to use, which is why this panel is kind of good because like I I'm purposely not using a Blackmagic micro camera with an ATEM Mini right now, and using my my laptop camera to see how good I can have it with the Nano Light, you know, and and see how good like to your point about you know we're having to be in front of the camera right now. Uh, I I was like let me try to do this in a way that's not professional and see how good you can get it. You're backlit there. I mean, that's generally something as soon as I see that uh, on a client side, I'm like, no, please close your blinds. Let's pick a different background. Um, but, but it's good we can trust you because you've got a, some, some yeah, front got lighting there. Yeah, I light you can see in front of my glasses. I got it right in front of my face. Perfect. All right. Uh, Jonathan, uh, let's uh, move over to you there. So you guys push a lot of uh, content in the live music market. Tell us a bit about the, your company and, uh, and what changes you've noticed. Sure. So, you know, our, our businesses are music venue businesses. We own Brooklyn Bowl, Brooklyn Bowl, Nashville, Brooklyn Bowl, Las Vegas. We have the Capitol Theater in Porchester, New York. We have a Jerry Garcia theme bar called Garcia's. And, you know, throughout those venues, we're doing about a thousand concerts a year. And that's all been stopped with COVID. So we were in the live music landscape pioneers in streaming. We've been streaming for 20 years, um, you know, started in audio migrated to video 
And now that is the epicenter of our business. So we're using the rooms as sound stages. We're doing crowdless concerts in our venues, streaming those either donation based models or pay-per-view models. And just for, to put it in perspective, last year in 2019, we did about 120 live streams through the whole year across all of our venues from April 2nd to today, we're at 120 streams. So we're outputting more. Um, what's happening now in, the, in live music is there is a reemergence. Drive-in concerts are uh, now where people are going to see live music, but they're also being streamed because capacity is limited. So uh, it's, it's just fascinating to watch that this is where people predominantly consume live music now because they don't have the ability to do it in a live space. Interesting. All right. Well, let's talk about some viewer concerns uh, when it comes to, you know, viewing content and as well as, you know, when we're producing content, what are some of the considerations when selecting a platform? Um, when I think about this, I think back to the early 2000s when uh, the Vancouver Canucks were playing some NHL playoff hockey and uh, I was renting a basement suite and the people above me um, were also watching the game. One of us was on satellite, the other was on cable. And there was definitely a bit of a latency issue, so much so that every single breakaway and offensive opportunity that the Canucks had, um, I knew the result before it happened on my TV because upstairs was either cheering or jeering, depending on the closer to real time result. Uh, let's talk about latency. Let's talk about uh, the different platforms and some of uh, the impacts of, of choosing a Zoom versus a live streaming platform and then adding on some DRM protection. What, what does that do for the viewer experience? Well, it should be, it should be seamless to the viewer experience uh, as far as, but I've found that, and I'm probably Corey and is getting the same cause as is because so many people are used to this whole Zoom experience where it's quick and it's instantaneous and low latency, they expect everything else we do in video to be exactly the same. And then you have to explain to them, it's like, well, this is in the middle of nowhere and we're going over a satellite or we're going over a cellular bonded solution. It's like there's latency involved and they, they will not understand it. You, you can go to talk to your blue in the face. They don't understand the technical side behind it. They just wanted to, well, why can't we just do it like Zoom? And I, I had just had a client yesterday and they're like, well, let's just use Zoom. And that's what it was. You know, in terms of the sports, I think uh, there is this expectation that the latency has to be as good as the broadcast level. And that's really tough for a streaming platform. And uh, there is a lot of things happening on the video chain for streaming services and uh, trying to cut down technical latency in each of those steps is a challenge. I mean, broadcast uh, latency, I think is about the six seconds lag from really when the content, the action happens in the field until you see a rendering picture on the screen. And getting the streaming down to that level is becoming closer and closer. It started from 20, 30 seconds, and now we are seeing it, pushing it down to that level. And that's really important. From our side, I want to basically say, when you look at adding content protection, DRM, and anti-piracy techniques on top of video, right, you have to be very careful on not adding additional latency and don't cause problems for the service providers. And there are several techniques that are used uh, which really try to eliminate as much as you can in terms of how fast you deliver the DRM licenses or keys to the devices or how fast you are going to try to uh, extract the kind of identifications from the pirated contents in order to you know, identify you know, the pirated sites and so on. One more thing, I, sure, I was going to say, I mean, there's also one more concern besides latency. I mean, uh, scalability of the platform, right? When you look at live streaming, obviously all the con users are looking and watching the content simultaneously. And this is obvious with the sports and concerts and so on. And uh, I think this pandemic is pushing the boundaries, you know, for that. There are more and more people tuned to the specific service at the same time, and they all have to be able to decrypt and play back that content in real time. And so uh, having the right, you know, cloud-based platform, which is scalable to millions and millions of people is a key factor here. And I'm sure, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you guys have more uh, insight about that as well. 
I, I can attest to that also for sure. Our cloud-based platforms that we're using ourselves and then also building out for our clients that are production people. Uh, we were using AWS in uh, Ohio for because it was just closer to where they were. It came to a grinding halt earlier this week because there was no more availability in that capacity that they had there. So they were having to spin up new hardware in order to get more people to subscribe to it. A lot of us are, are going that direction, or I've been there for a couple of years, but since we're going that direction, there's so many people pushing that direction, the cloud providers are scrambling right now. They're, and it doesn't matter if it's AWS, Google, or Azure, they, they're all scrambling to get more hardware implemented in our configurations. Regular CPU-based hardware is not that hard to do, but we need GPU in a lot of our instances. And so that's where I've noticed that, especially uh, for the cloud buildups. I mean, we had one client that's using uh, nine different vMix machines on a, in a cloud cluster. And uh, and it was just, it was having all kinds of problems because he couldn't start all of them at one time. He couldn't start even a few of them at a time. He had to keep just kind of like sneaking in on it every once in a while. And, and finally he got them all running and it's all fine after that until later in the day, whenever the capacity in that node, in that little section of the cloud, started running out of capacity. You know, when we go back to March, we, we, we uh, you know, Zoom was one of the big players early on that, that seemed to gain a lot of traction and they definitely went through their, their hiccups, right? With their, uh, uh, they didn't have the proper encryption there uh, on both ends, uh, but then it came back into favor. Uh, it, they seem, you know, they, they've been solving some of the issues there and in general, I would say they, they've been very stable. I, I've noticed fewer hiccups uh, using them than my clients have with, with Teams, uh, which seems to sometimes be down. Uh, last week it was down for quite a few hours and that affected things a lot. Um, it, what ha, what's the impact of Zoom being on our market and, and moving forward, the, the expectations that producers and clients are gonna have? Uh, Cor, do you wanna start with that one? Yeah, I think that's a great, I think that's, you know, look, Zoom is an amazing production tool. Let's not split hairs. Let's not, let's call a spade what a spade is, right? We have some clients who want to use Google Meet or they want to use Teams or they want to use something else, but pretty much our preferred workflow for as far as like, hey, let's all get together and make a show together. Now, maybe we might put in some of the content, right? So the back end producer place can be for the Zoom. Also the guests, the rooms, like we've created probably like, eight different workflows using Zoom, sometimes as an input source into a switcher, sometimes as an out, I mean, it's crazy, right? I think that as a production tool, it's allowed the, uh, our, our industry to innovate in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to. So we use SRT, we use, um, we have a product called LiveX Director that gets you two to 400 milliseconds so that someone can actually cut cameras remotely, right? Like, well, we, I think back to that latency thing and the Zoom thing, it's like you almost have this differentiation of products for the thing that you're trying to do. Hey, I'm a director, I need to cut a show. Okay, well you need this ultra low latency product. Hey, I'm a backbench producer and I one to two seconds is okay for me. Okay, well we're gonna put you in a Zoom. Um, hey, I have 20 consumers that have to come on this, this show and they have their laptop camera. Okay, get our Rivet app or use Zoom. So I think it's been kind of revolutionary. I think, I think it was made for this moment. And, you know, I wanted to poo-poo it so hard. I'm telling you, like, I wanted to be like, you're going to use Zoom. You don't know what you're doing in March. And I was full of shit. Like, it is, it is, it is a legit product of, for today's market. Well, I, I definitely can echo those sentiments because early in March when I was, uh, my whole business was just consulting my existing or my previous clients, we'll call them because they were no longer doing much business, um, but consulting with them as to how they were going to pivot and what platforms they were going to use. And the obvious one seemed to be Zoom, but because they were going through some challenges early on, I was able to say, well, yes, you can use Zoom, but here's some of the challenges. Here are some other platforms that you may want to be looking at uh, and that I can recommend and train you on. So, you know, as a consultant, it was good to be able to recommend something that was different than the, the consumer or the obvious option. But now it's harder to, rec to not recommend Zoom because it's stable, it does a really good job, everyone has used it. Um, and you need to have a really compelling reason uh, not to recommend it uh, moving forward. Uh, I think yeah, I think Corey would probably agree with me on this. Is the the reason not to use Zoom would be 
if you had like Corey's a great product, by the way, Corey Rivet, uh, to bring multiple people in that you need to control. That's that's where you use the other tools. If yep. you just need easiness and uh, just a common way to, for everybody to get into it, then Zoom's still a go-to without a doubt. Teams is right though, right behind it for us, especially with the new NDI outputs. Uh, that that opened up a whole nother world uh, for us also. All right, let me turn over to Eric here. Eric, I think we've got some questions coming in from our uh, our viewers there. Yeah, we do. Um, we've got two or three of them right now. Uh, one of them, uh, and I'll, I'll try not to direct any of them too specifically to one panelist or another, but uh, Corey, this one is specifically for you. You talked about your LiveX director. Uh, are any of these workflows available for public consumption? Yes. So LiveX director is a product that we have. Um, it, it's ultra low latency for directors that's available on our website. And also Rivet, Jeff, thank you for the, that. Rivet, we made an app that utilizes SRT for Mac OS, um, Windows, uh, iOS, and uh, Android. And really it's public, it's, it, it, to Jeff's point, we, uh, for the DNC, we built 80 mobile kits named after cheese. So we built these Pixel 4 Android and uh, Galaxy S20 and a Halo light and in a Pelican case. And it's just hilarious. Like the, the quality of a phone is amazing. Okay. Like it's, it's so amazing. Like the audio is still kind of an issue with phones, but we're finding like trying to use phones as much as possible and trying to use like mage wells into laptops. But one of my favorite workflows is we built a zoom farm and it's, it's an, it's, or it's an order to record pin spotlights, but the, the key problem is because of the ducking of the audio in a Zoom, right? So Sean will start speaking and then, and then you know, Ali will start speaking and I can't get the isolated audio. So what we found is we have a workflow where we use guest rooms. So we put everybody in a guest room, but then we give them a Zoom grid that we made. And we found that by doing that, we're able to get isolated audio using Dante. It's a really cool workflow, but it requires like 20 PCs. <laughs> on on site it's a little bit annoying but uh yeah we can share some of our workflows for sure so i think the question was uh, are any of these workflows available for public consumption so this probably isn't one that most of uh you know most home users are going to be taking on themselves but uh, but I'm, thank you for agreeing to share that workflow there because i think you know in the industry it just helps out those that are are doing this kind of work uh, probably it's just going to point them right back to you to, to have you take care of it for them once they realize, hang on, this is a little bit challenging, but right. uh, yeah, that's the And actually it. your comment, Sean, leads us uh, nicely into the next question, which uh, comes from someone who says, I live in a town that has fiber to the house for the entire city. My base speed is a half gig up and down and is cheap. What would it take hardware wise to spool up my own quote unquote cloud solution in my basement? so I could be the master of my own destiny. Destiny. So looking for some hardware and software recommendations there. Um, perhaps start with uh, Jonathan. Do you have any thoughts on that? And then let's go around the room. That is way out of the realm of uh, my expertise. <laughs> okay, I sent it to the wrong person. Uh, yeah. Jeff? Uh, yeah, and actually, I know Jim. I know what he's up to. He's, he's up to no good, as usual. Uh, Jim really is uh, pushing the limits in, in a lot of his uh, implementations, doing some remote stuff too, remote production things. Um, the, the, uh, the major issue is a cloud is just somebody else's computer. They, they, in the simplest form, that, the cloud is just somebody else's computer. It's not your own. So if you want to build your own cloud, then you just set up a bunch of computers, kind of like uh, Corey was saying with the Zoom form and my 12 Dell servers sitting over here to the side that I had to shut off because they were too loud. So yes, the, a cloud can definitely be built in and it just depends on how stable. And this is one of the things we I, we get it a lot too is, oh, oh, I have really fast, info. no, it's never referred to as internet, right guys? It's always referred to as, oh yeah, my Wi-Fi is really fast. It's always the Wi-Fi. Uh, but even though they're plugged in, it's still the Wi-Fi. But anyway, I digress. So whenever you have fast internet, sometimes it may be coming from a, like a, a municipality, like uh, Lafayette is one of my, my employees, lives out that way. They've got gigabit up and down if from the city, fiber to the house. I mean, it's fantastic. It's like 50 bucks a month, super cheap, but it's still shared with everybody else. So there's no SLA. So there's no guarantee that you're going to get that speed at all times. And I've seen gigabit lines 
start crawling after you start doing too much and everybody gets home, especially with education as it is right now. Everybody is using it. Same thing with the cellular towers too. So you're saturating all your pipes. It doesn't really help you if you have either uh, you know, a 10 gig at, at your house if everything else is being shared across it. Uh, so it's all about redundancy. Whenever you start talking about a home network, then you've got a plan on that also. So having uh, two lines and building out your, quote, your master control system with all your other computers, totally doable. Right? Corey's done it, I'm sure, with his stuff. I've done it with ours. Uh, but it's, it's definitely uh, not for the timid. But I know Jim's not timid, so he's going to be going at it full speed. Well, one of the things when I hear, you know, gigabit and, and fiber and, and a lot of the different internet speed, um, it, I think it's a, there's a challenge because on the consumer side, you know, the, the uh, providers, they give us the the download speed all the time. That's what they're marketing at. And as producers, we care about the upload speed. And with fiber, it should be able to be parallel, right? It should be the same thing, but uh, in reality, it depends on how- uh, AT&T companies... charges more. Uh, yeah, so yeah. you can get it uh, symmetrical or asymmetrical. And so for us, uh, we have both. And so I've got a, a spectrum line that is symmetrical, but then also have an AT&T line that's, that's opposite. But it's okay because I've got a gig down and then 200 up. So even at 200 up, it's still more than enough to do just about everything we need to do. But we, if we need to, we fail over to the other line. It is ridiculous. We had to get rid of the residential line in here that they could only do 20 megs up. In, and so I had to move to a business line in, in this office and they only gave us 35 up. We can get one gig down and 35 up. It's ridiculous. But to that point, the municipalities that have built out fiber, so we're building a new office in Green Bay um, in the rail yards where they have a gig. And for what we pay $1,800 SLA a month for one gig in New York is $400. And it's the same. And so it's incredible, right? You still got to run the trace route. You still got to say, hey, at the end of the day, people don't want to hear this, but it's plumbing. Where is the line going to? Is it going to the Google building? Is it going to Chicago, then going to Minneapolis? Where, where is your line going to and what is the SLA on it? And just to answer Eric's question about like, I always, I always tell everybody, okay, you're on OBS. Have you used OBS? Okay, cool. Go to vMix. <laughs> download the free trial and like I don't work for vMix okay I'm just saying and and we've been using vMix by the way for over six years like we didn't just pick it up in March like we've been using it for a long time and it's an amazing it's an amazing piece of software every Remy that we have every master control room that we have has two to three instances of vMix whether for NDI whether for SRT whether for baseband SDI it's an amazing amazing we use it for graphics we use it for social we use it for all kinds of things and so my number one thing I always tell people is like just get the free trial of vmix and try it out because you could literally with three pcs or two pcs or one pc you could you could have a whole business that makes six figures a year in your basement with a fiber gig line pretty simply like it's not easy but you could do it definitely yes i mean vmix is one of the uh, the main solutions that we use and we use it even when there isn't even a live application you know something as boring as a legal video deposition where we're like well we'd like to deliver the client a usb stick with the recording on there as soon as we're done because we don't want to make real time dvds because that's so dead um, we just throw that thing into vmix and then pop out a usb stick and we still get attorneys going what that's it you're done and we're like yeah <laughs> here you go but i mean definitely on the live side it's uh, it is our our solution of choice um i think uh, eric uh um definitely can speak to having discovered them if you will at nab many years ago uh, he was one of the, the first people in the media who came across uh, martin's booth there and said hey you know these guys have some potential and, and i'll admit at that time i was thinking what I don't get it yet. Um, you know, it was a little bit maybe it's so ahead true, of its time. Sean. Yeah, it's yeah. so true. You know what? What's funny is I was I was at livestream.com and uh, we had done a booth with Teradek, and the next year Teradek had done their own booth, and we weren't doing the live show. And I walked into their booth. This is when they first started doing their live, like in the glass that they don't do anymore. And I'm like, "What are you guys using?" And they were like, "Oh, VMix." I'm like, "What the hell is that crap? Like, is that like Wirecast Plus?" like what is this and it was so funny because over time that's like 2012 13 right 
over time, I was like, wow, this is an incredible piece of software. And, and it's proven out. I, I bet if Martin Sinclair, if you told Martin Sinclair, who is the developer of vMix, where vMix would be today, I mean, he built that for his church software. Like, that's literally why he built it. It's incredible. It's incredible software. And he's one guy, you know, it's not a whole team, right? It doesn't have multi-million dollar backing and, and developers galore. It's one guy. True. So, hey, um, l- let me turn over to Jonathan here because I-, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how production has changed for you. Um, I mean, you guys have been very successful in, um, in pivoting and changing what you're doing. You're breaking the fourth wall and it's been very successful. Uh, tell me about that. Sure. So, in our culture, in, in uh, our bread and butter is really what they call the jam scene. So it's music rooted in the Grateful Dead and, and jam rock. And uh, that culture for decades has been live streaming concerts. They've been sitting at home and it's the, the term that we use is called couch tour. You know, so rather going on tour with the band, you sit at home on the couch and you just watch the entire tour. So one thing that we noticed was that people couldn't go out to see live shows and there's a level of connectivity. When you go to a concert hall, you get to interface with other human beings and share stories and talk about the music. So we decided to turn the camera around on couch tour and show people at home and and it's been great. So we've been doing that a bunch of different ways. Um, We use Zoom as the main product of that. Um, It becomes a two screen experience. So you are watching the stream on your primary device, whether that's a television or a computer, and then you're using a secondary device, whether it's a phone or a tablet or another computer that is using Zoom. So uh, back to the latency point, it's been kind of interesting just because people are uh, working with the latency issue. And the nice thing about music is it's very forgiving. You have verses, you have choruses, so things repeat. So as a director, you're able to stage things in that environment. So if someone is singing the chorus and it already happened, you can show it again and cheat it live. And we do that a lot. So then it has a really you know, live feel to it. So we've been creating these online communities through different types of shows, usually broken down by themes or music genres where these different you know, tribes of people will come every week to watch a concert and then have what I kind of call like a nightclub experience. So they're hanging out in the Zoom. We mute our Zooms uh, to sort of uh, stop the cacophony of sound that would happen if everybody's mics were on. So they're using chat to communicate with each other. They're watching the live stream on their primary device and they're dancing and they're having a good time. So we have uh, then taken that up another notch in projecting it into our venues. So uh, the Brooklyn Bowl venues are, you know, it's one part music venue, one part bowling, one part restaurant, and all of the bowling lanes have projection screens at the end. And so what we've been doing in our crowdless environments so that the artists have people that interact with is we're projecting the zooms onto those screens, or in the case of the Capitol Theater, onto the theater walls, so that the artists may be in, an, in a crowdless environment, however, they're seeing the people at home they can kind of communicate to them, they can vibe off of that. And then the people at home are also being integrated into the stream, whether that's a camera op actually physically shooting the screens or full fade dissolves of um, what we do is streaming the Zoom to you know an input in a switcher or an input in live stream studio, and then bringing those people in, whether it's full frame devolved or picture in picture. So it's been a really uh, good communal experience to kind of bring that vibe back to music fans who can't really get it right now. It's, it's fascinating because this is not something that uh, these workflows, right, that we probably would have envisioned a few months ago uh, as being something we want to do. Why would we want to bring people watching at home into our live production? But, but now it's that fan side experience that's so important. I mean, you know, uh, back to hockey, I was watching NHL games and there's no fans in the stands. And I mean, they, they had to be innovative because they were realizing the pucks were ending up on the canvas that was covering the seats. Uh, and so that they were having people using actually uh, pool nets to hook the pucks out because it looked really funny when there were stray pucks there after practices. Um, you know, the same type of innovations coming into some of our productions. I mean, Corey, you talked a bit about some some of your uh, experiences there. Um, I'll, I'll throw to you in a moment, Jeff. But I mean, one of the things that uh, we did last week was a, a sommelier uh, smackdown. So the sommeliers are the people that do the wine pairing, the gastronomy, right? And so we had three contestants. Uh, we had chefs bringing them out plated food, and they had to... Uh, 
pair a wine with these chef creations. And um, we also had to incorporate live cooks that were at home uh, who were judging. So they were actually cooking these same chef dishes and having the same bottles of wine sent to them and they joined in via Zoom. Um, so a really neat workflow, whereas before everyone would just be packed in one big room, food and wine would be flowing and the, the judging would happen. And here we were with, you know, multiple different locations all connected via Zoom and then streamed out to a live audience there. Um, Jeff, what innovative workflows have you seen on your end? Uh, we're definitely twisting it around a lot. Uh, most of our, we've actually been doing remote productions for a couple of years now. Uh, we use robotic cameras. Uh, we started with robotic cameras, we actually started with graphics about six years, seven years ago. And that was an easy one to remote. Um, then, and we're giving them a feedback that the graphics op is just sitting at home, just chasing the, the scores. Uh, then we were able to move to automated scores. So that actually made it a little bit easier for everything. But then as we kept moving forward, I just kept, they just kept it in the back of my head. It's like, well, why can't we do more? And so we invested in uh, the Mark Roberts robotics cameras, which are all IP based to start with. So we started with, let's get the guys off the courts where, where it could be anywhere from 100 to 120 degrees on the court. It, is just brutal in the summer and of course we were everywhere it was hot so once we got the guys off the courts and got them in the truck then of course it's ip based and all this time is my mind i'm thinking why why were we doing this somewhere else and so we started pushing it and started pushing the envelope a lot and we got to where we could very efficiently just distribute our workflow throughout the country. So we do mostly mostly all North American events, uh, basically US and Canada. We used to do can um, a, a lot of events in Mexico also. But whenever we were sending out guys, I might have guys in Atlanta, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. I've got a guy in uh, Kentucky and, and then my guys where we're taking shifts and we're taking uh, not only shifts, but always taking uh, in a rotation between who's out this week, who's out the next week, et cetera. We may have anywhere from four, five, six, as many as seven or eight events on a weekend, but we're able to spread out to a freelancer base and also to our full times and get them a, a better quality of life because they don't have to travel so much. So we were, we were already doing this. This, this was well before COVID. Uh, but it allowed us, because we had that technology already in place, it allowed us very quickly to pivot and say, okay, let's start doing some remote uh, production. We can send out camera kits with one EIC. That's only, all his job is there is to set up stuff and put out fires. That's it. And then maybe have a second form if you wanted to, but a couple guys could go out, set up a complete show, and then everybody else could be completely remotely. And it, it's a phenomenal workflow once you work it out. There's a lot of us, not just in, and I'm not a huge broadcaster by any means, but, uh, you know, it pains me to see four trucks sitting in the back. <laughs> but uh, whenever, when we do have events, it's, it just makes me smile whenever you can just say, hey, uh, can you take over for a little bit and walk away? If you need to take a bio break or whatever, you can walk away and you know that the, the show is still running perfectly fine because we're either doing the switching on site or we're doing the switching in the cloud. It doesn't matter. It's being done and it's running fine because of a distributed workflow. So that's the big change that we've seen. And I don't think it's going to change anymore moving forward. I think we're going to see a hybrid combination of production moving forward. There's going to be people on site, but there's not going to be as many people. A, a big truck rolling on site is not going to have 20 or 30 anymore it's going to be a half that or maybe even less. It, they're definitely very optimized workflows that uh, we're in, entering into here. Um, you know, I, I can ask you guys about the presidential stuff uh, very shortly there, but I, I did want to ask uh, Ali on a related note there. I mean, we were talking about Russian, um, you know, hackers there and, uh, you know, them entering into the workflows. Ali, what, what do you guys do with that? Uh, you know, what are some of the the techniques and the tools at your disposal to to try to stop that spread, that piracy? You know, that the Russian influence. Um, you know, maybe we couldn't stop them the last election there, but uh, you know, can you help us out? <laughs> yeah. So again, I'm very focused on the distribution to the subscribers, right? And so we're going to talk about when there is a live streaming, specifically a sports, for example, or anything related to live events, how can you identify the pirate sites and shut it down? So there are really two steps here. First step is to technically leverage technologies like digital fingerprinting 
which are used for automatic content, uh, uh, automatic content recognition, ACR, that are actually used to identify if a content is licensed to a specific entity. So when you see a pirated link, first you gotta see who that content which is being pirated from is and like, so who was this content licensed for? Because obviously, the, for example, a football game, a soccer game is being licensed to different people. And you have to, the first level is identifying where uh, the licensee was. Then the next level is from each of those licensees, whether it was a broadcast delivery or a streaming service, you need to know which of the subscribers was behind that sub, uh, piracy. So this next level is really by embedding a unique identification called watermark IDs inside the video as the live stream is being broadcasted. And that happens in two different workflows. One is really during the video preparation, during encoding and content delivery on the CDN that you really deliver a unique set of video which has some hidden features imperceptible on the video to each specific users. Or there are some client side approaches where as the content is being uh, rendered on the screen, there is some unique ID for that specific user is embedded on the video very imperceptibly. Obviously this has to be in such a way that doesn't add any artifact to the video, but it helps you to identify who was the last authorized user or pay subscriber for that video, which was later on used in piracy. And when it comes to live streaming, the main factor is how soon you can actually identify that ID. So it's a chain of, in a live event, you have to quickly really monitor the web and identify the digital fingerprint for a pirated site, match it to where, uh, who was the you know, licensee behind that, and then from that licensee, you identify which was the unique ID for the subscriber that was used. And all of these have to happen in a very short amount of time in order to enable you to actually stop that piracy or disrupt that viewing, which is a growing problem. And uh, there are certain successful stories about that. And more and more is becoming really a requirement when a sports licensee, a licensor is actually putting these as part of the, you know, uh, uh, requirements in their licensing agreements. So who are the bad actors? I mean, where are they situated? Where are your clients based in on a global basis? Well, they're, they're everywhere and they are actually, so what they do is they're trying to present a portfolio of several challenge, cha channels at the same time to present to subscribers or to the regular viewers that they are really like a legitimate service. So there are really selling subscription fees for their service. The online ad networks mistakes them with leg legitimate services because they have a really professional guide, uh, program guide, right? They have these channels and they offer some subscriptions of even the legal, uh, the legitimate services at the lower price, right? To absorb new customers. Uh, one of the names that I can say, I mean, you might have heard the Cody boxes or uh, Cody services, that's very popular. I mean, they actually sell a built-in box with all the plugin and software that can be used for accessing thousands of challenges from everywhere around the world, right? So these are the kind of targeted piracy sites. But when it comes to sports, they're really like a live streaming, like sports, they're really like packages. Uh, I mean, uh, in certain countries, Middle East, Eastern Europe, that they're running this uh, anti, uh, ser uh, pirated service and selling subscriptions. Like in Spain, there is a service you pay five, five, five euros a month and you can watch all the soccer from Spain. And yeah, so <laughs> it's a global issue and it's really impacting the revenue for content providers. Okay, thank you, Ali. That's, a, that's very insightful there. I mean, it's it definitely a very challenging uh, field we get, we're entering in when you're trying to monetize and then protect content. Um, we're, we're getting towards the end of our panel here, so I, I wanted to just give each of you an opportunity to, um, to give some advice to producers out there that are trying to pivot. Um, what, what are some of the things they should be looking to do and, um, you know, what, what's working? So, Corey, let's start with you. I think uh, I was so fascinated by what you were talking about, the chefs watching each other. I think that we have an incredible opportunity because people are being forced to innovate. <laughs> I've spent my entire life telling people, hey, you're gonna put that on stream. You're gonna put that on a stream to television broadcasters. And they literally looked at me back in 2004, like a ah, kid, get out of here. And so it's been really fascinating to see this ramp up, but then this year, especially, 
you know, as much as 2020 sucks, uh, this forced innovation, uh, the only way to talk about it, right? Uh, what I would say to operators, like, look, throw away the playbook, throw away everything you knew before and think about those things. Like, that's so great to have a chef watch a sommelier and like, and have this interaction between different people and come up with content that's never been done before. And so that's incredibly exciting to me. I know that doesn't really, and, and that can pay the bills too, by the way, right? Because at some point you could come up with a, with a content genre or, or a, a content idea that could be, you know, blow up. Um, if you're starting out to your question, Sean, um, I mentioned vMix. Um, start cheap start with like obs start with start with the things that you have in front of you there's plenty of things our computers that we have with us there's plenty of free things out there and the greatest thing that i did not have in my 20s is youtube by the way i mean you could you you could do anything you could you could be an astronaut watching youtube videos at this point it's like ridiculous right, right. um that you know we it's small plug. We have a YouTube where we unbox a lot of videos and we talk through our stuff. So, but um, those are kind of my recommendations. I know they're maybe a little bit cheesy, but uh, that's kind of our go-to where we go to is start with vMix and then kind of look what's out there and, and, and look what we have to provide for, for what the clients want. Yes. I, I would definitely say if you're not already looking at the cloud, as far as for production resources, start now. If you haven't been doing that for the last five months, if you've been sitting at home, as some of us have, uh, not working on a regular basis, then start now. And, and use those YouTube resources. Use all the resources out there that you can learn about the basics of it. Uh, if you need to bring somebody like me or Corey that, that is a, a system integrator that knows and understands the cloud, it can help you get started and give you a kickstart. But the main thing is be looking at the cloud as the future of production. If you're not in the cloud, you're going to be left behind. There's no way I could ever say that any cleaner than that. If you're not in the cloud now, that is where everything in production is going to be. It may not happen in a year, but it's happening at light speed faster than anybody ever expected it to. For sure, yeah. All right, uh, Jonathan. I, I think patience and education, and the reason I say that is from our specific use, use case where, you know, in the music business, you have box office people, merch people, bartenders, marketing people, general managers. You're, they're all production people now. Every, the, our entire business has shifted to streaming. so. Um, what we have done is we have taken people who were not in this space at all, that knew nothing about live streaming, video production, sound, and they're all becoming experts in it. And um, we've had to really educate our teams about it and do a ton of training to maintain a staff and then have a staff that can implement all this stuff. I have people who are remoting in to live switching software that have never had production experience at all, and they're taking cues, they're on comm with a director, they're punching in graphics, maybe they're building Facebook live events, maybe they're building YouTube live events. Um, it's really amazing to watch. It's, it, it's, it's fascinating because I think all of us have been in the space for a very long time, but at least in my business, the entire business is in the space. So I think uh, utilizing your staff and spending the time on training, because if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't be where we are. We wouldn't be you know, we're doing so many streams, we need a lot of manpower to do it. And, and we have because we've spent the time to educate our staff, train them and get them into a really comfortable space. And the nice thing is they enjoy it. I mean, we're lucky we deal with music, people are very passionate about music. So when a marketing or a box office person comes to a production shoot for music, they're there for the music. And so they're inspired by that. And they're doing great work. That's a, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to jump in, but that's like a really great point. And that's like, great. I love that. The, the remote piece that I want to say, what we found is whatever you were, box office, uh, DP, cinematographer, in remote, just put the word technical support in front of your name and have lots of patience. Because that patience and vibe in this new production normal patience and how you are on the phone and on zoom is everything like we everything we've done for our company it's not about oh we're the masters we're professional what yes 
it's all about our vibe and, and how we communicate. And I love that. I love that. Like, you know, educating your, educating that person who's sitting in front of the camera, like, can you move your camera over there? And like how you interact with those people is everything. It's so important. The, mu the music business to me is really about trust, you know, artists, management team labels, they're going to come to you, whether you're a venue or a production company, because the vibe, it's a funny word, but it's the truth. It's, it's, if you have a good vibe about it and we're dealing with this all the time, we have artists in zoom where we're doing live Q and A's who have no idea how to set anything this up and that you have to sit there and coach them through it with a smile on your face. And it's very, very important. Yeah. I definitely know that my favorite tech support tip for uh, my clients is let's just reboot your computer and let's start again. And all of a sudden the problem goes away, right? Or the pending windows update, whatever it is there. All clear, right. clear your cache, then reboot. That's okay. that's my favorite. <laughs> I'll add that one in there to the, uh, the the tips notes that I'm passing on there. All right, as we're uh, running to a close here, uh, Ali, I want to leave you with last word here. Any advice for uh, producers that need to consider protecting their content or production tips for them? Well, no, it, it was great experience to be here. Obviously, you guys are doing fantastic job producing the content, and with this difficult time taking the challenge on. Uh, I really enjoy the different workflows that I heard here and they're gonna be really the future of video production. Uh, obviously, what you generate is a crown jewel of your business and that needs to be protected. So what I wanna end with is you, what you generate is gonna bring revenue for you and your customers. The main thing is to make sure that's protected by uh, content protection technologies such as DRM and by anti-piracy technologies in order to prevent really uh, pirates to stream, re-stream your crown jewels. So put Great. that in mind for sure. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Jonathan, Jeff, Corey. Uh, on behalf of myself, Sean Lamb, I'd like to turn it back to Eric. And thank you very much, Sean, for moderating the discussion and showing how a discussion can be moderated. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks to all the speakers. That was a great discussion. Could have gone on much longer. Thanks to the audience for your questions. Some of them, frankly, were, were really tech. They were great questions, but we didn't want to get too deep down technical rabbit holes uh, that might not apply to all of our viewers. Um, but I'm sure any of our speakers would be happy with you reaching out uh, to me to put you in touch with them if you have specific questions for them.